The United States of America was once known as one of the greatest countries in the world. Though other countries had, of course, freedoms, the United States was a little different. The United States of America put a very strong emphasis on personal liberty. It was the belief that the government did not have to interfere in your life. You had the freedom to go and live without Big Brother looking over your shoulder. Our Founding Fathers created what is known as the Bill of Rights, and these liberties that are contained inside were the foundation of what was necessary to have a civil and peaceful democratic government. In what is known as the First Amendment, inside we have one right known as the freedom of speech. The freedom of speech says that you are allowed to tell the government how it should run, how you believe a community should function so we all can flourish, and it gives you the right to state how other citizens should behave so that we can live together in a community. But it seems it's that last part, how we should behave so we can live in the community that has recently come under attack. The United States of America seems to be moving into a very intolerant era. It's a paradox, but it seems that those who cry for tolerance the most seem sometimes to be the least tolerant among us. There's a standard, a status quo, which we call political correctness. If you speak against this political correctness, it very well may be labeled hate speech. And if you are saying these things in hate speech, well, you very well may be punished with the club of cancel culture. It seems that in America, we're not able to civilly disagree with one another. Instead, it very quickly devolves into a war of words. And usually in this war of words, we hear a common phrase. Who are you to judge? Who are you to tell me how I should live my life? Who are you to tell me what is ethical? Who are you to raise up this moral standard? Who are you? To judge. And the savviest of them will even show you that Jesus allegedly said the same thing. Matthew 7, verse 1 Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. And the people will look at you and say, See, when you tell me that I should live according to this moral standard, you're judging. And Jesus says you're not supposed to do that. Who are you to judge? But we have to ask ourselves a question. Is that really what Jesus means? When Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged, is he really saying you cannot call sin, sin? Is he saying you cannot call evil, evil? Is he really saying you cannot hold the community to a moral standard. Well, that is exactly what many people think he is saying. And that's not just in the world. It's also in the church. Recently, Megan and I had a discussion on Facebook. We entered into an ethical debate with some other Seventh-day Adventists. And for those of you who have made the mistake of entering into a Facebook debate, you know that uh, pouring blood into a pool of piranhas seems rather peaceful to what you may encounter in a Facebook debate. But Big and I remained calm, and we laid out our case biblically and logically. I was not prepared for the amount of hate, the amount of uncivility, the amount of aggression and blaming that came our way. The other side cited no scripture. They did not use any logical arguments. They just simply said, 
If you try holding other people to a moral standard, you are unloving and you are judging. And Jesus says, you cannot do that. So we need to ask ourselves a question today, I believe. When Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged, is he really saying that you have no right to call other people to live a moral standard? Well, if that is what he means, then, well, it completely undermines the entire gospel. Because if you cannot tell people that they are in sin, then you cannot tell them that they're lost. And if you can't tell them they're lost, you can't tell them that we're in the middle of an investigative judgment. And if you can't tell them that we are in the middle of an investigative judgment, then you cannot tell them Christ is coming again soon. And if you cannot tell them Christ is coming again soon, then you cannot call them to the way of salvation. If Jesus really does mean you have no right to call people to live a moral standard, then Jesus becomes the biggest hypocrite the world has ever seen. Because Jesus is always calling people to live a moral standard. Jesus called the Sadducees a brood of vipers. He said to the Pharisees what we call the seven woes. Right? He said to the rich young ruler, when the rich young ruler came to him and said, what must I do to be saved? Jesus told him to keep the commands. And then the rich young ruler said, I've done all of that. And then Jesus said, this one thing you have not done. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Jesus was calling him to an ethical, moral standard of living. Jesus was more than happy to call people to a moral standard of living if the action they were doing jeopardized their salvation. But if Jesus really is saying, and do not judge or you too will be judged, if he really is saying you cannot hold people to a moral standard, then the Bible is the biggest fraud in the world. From Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation, it is consistently holding us to a moral standard. It tells us that certain actions are wrong. We call that sin. And if Jesus really does mean you cannot hold people to a moral standard, then the Holy Spirit has no purpose in your life because John 14 tells us that one of his ministries is to convict the world of sin. When Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged, is he really saying you cannot call people to moral living? That is not at all what Jesus is saying. What Jesus does say, though, is far deeper, far more loving, and far more redemptive than most people give it credit for. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is saying something simple. He is saying, transform yourself first, and then you will have the power to transform the world. Let's look at the entire passage in its context. Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. And I will be reading from the New International Version. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And that's where most people stop. They don't read verses 3 through 5. But is verses 3 through 5 to fully help us understand what Jesus is saying? Picking up in verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now in this passage, there are two little details 
that you need to see so you understand what Jesus is saying. First of all, the plank and the speck of sawdust are the same material. They are both wood. Secondly, the plank is really big and the speck is really small. Whoa, pastor, mind blown, right? Wow, pastor, thank you for pointing that out. Right, the depth of the Bible has just been unearthed. Now, of course, I say this tongue in cheek. But the point I want to bring out is that so often we skim over these small details, not realizing that the small details are really a gold mine of truth. Because these two details, that the plank and the speck are both wood, and one is big and one is small, helps us fully understand what Jesus is really saying. In its most basic, Jesus is just saying this. When there is a brother who is going through a small problem, and you are going through the same problem, but bigger. First, work on your big problem. And once you've done that, you can go and help your brother with his small problem. In other words, Jesus is saying this, transform yourself first, and then you will have the power to transform the world. And so often, though, we have it backwards. We don't want to start working on ourselves. We'd rather start working on you. Now, I believe that in this passage, the brother with the bigger problem is sincerely trying to help the brother with the smaller problem. He knows the struggle. He knows the suffering. He knows the stress. He knows the anguish. And he does not want this for the other brother. And so he goes to help him but he fails. Why does he fail? Well, according to Jesus, because he has not overcome his problem first. In other words, how can you hope to help a brother through their problem when you haven't even overcome your problem first? Instead, first take care of your issue. Then you will have the power to go and help the other brother in their issue. I'm reminded of a quote from a Hasidic rabbi that he penned at the time of his death. He said, when I was a young man, I dreamed of changing the world. But as I sought to do so, I realized this was too big for me. And so I tried to change my country. When I realized that this too was beyond my means, I set my sights a little smaller and tried changing my state. But this too would not budge, and so I tried to change my town, but they would hear none of it. And so I set my sights lower still and tried to change my family, but they knew who I really was, and so they would not listen to me. And now as I lie here on my deathbed, I realize I should have started by changing myself. Because if I had begun by changing myself, I may have been able to change my family. And from there I could have changed our town. And from there I could have changed our state. And who knows, I, I may have even been able to change our country. And if I had just started by working on myself, then who knows, I may have just been able to change the world. And that is what Jesus is saying here. He is saying, don't go and call someone else to a moral standard of living. Instead, bring yourself up to that moral standard. And then you will have the power and the perspective necessary to bring someone else to the same standard. Transform yourself first. Then you will have the power to transform the world. And to be fair, isn't that really what we all want? I mean, think about it. If you're going through a problem and you're going through a situation, who would you rather have help you? 
someone who has no clue what you're going through, or someone who has been there, done that, and lived to tell the tale. Most of us are going to choose a second person, the one that lived to tell the tale. Why? Because they understand. They know the struggle. They know the stress. They know the anxiety. They know what we have been going through. And they found a way. And it's through their struggle that we can have salvation. Have you ever thought about that? Your problem may be someone else's peace. Your mountain may be their miracle. Your obstacle may be their opportunity. Your struggle may be their salvation. Now Jesus knows that other people are struggling. And so he calls you to transform yourself first. And then you will have the power to transform the world. He specifically says so. Look at verse 5. You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will sit down and not help your brother do anything. It is that what he says? Not even close. First, take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Your struggle can be their salvation. Jesus is not saying you cannot call people to a moral standard. He is saying something far more redemptive. He is saying, overcome your problem first, and then you will be able to help others overcome as well. It is like the parable of the man who fell in a pit. One day a man is walking down the road, when all of a sudden he falls into a pit, a little sinkhole. The pit is too deep for him to jump out of, and it's too steep for him to climb. And so he begins to scream out for someone, help, help, someone come and help me. And after a few minutes, his friend peeks his head over. And the man says, oh, so glad that you're here. Please, friend, help me. And what do you think the friend did? He jumped right down into the pit. <laughs> and the man goes, you idiot, you dummy. Why did you jump in the pit? I, I didn't need you to jump in the pit. I needed you to get me out. And then the friend said these words. Oh, my friend, I am helping you out. You see, I have fallen in this pit before, but I have found a way of escape. I know the way out. When you overcome your problem, when you overcome your struggle, you too know the way out. And what Jesus is saying is once you overcome, once you know the way out, go forth, take others by the hand, and show them the same path. Now, I don't know what pit you're going through, or what struggle you may be facing. But Jesus wants you to be transformed. Jesus wants you to be redeemed. But he doesn't want the redemption to stop there. Like ripples in a pond from a stone being thrown through, Jesus wants the change to start with you, and then ripple out and change the world. When Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged, he is not saying don't uphold a moral standard. He is saying, become sanctified, embody that moral standard, and then you will be able to help others live the same way. Transform yourself first, and then you will have the power to transform the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. May the sanctification and salvation you bring to each of us May it ripple out from here. May it impact the lives of those around us, that they too will be transformed. May we truly become the light of the world and the salt of the earth, that this entire world may reflect the glory 
of your wonderful grace. This I say in your son's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Damascus, for joining me today. I'm sorry I was not able to be there with you in person, but I know that the Lord will bless you and he will keep you and he will ensure that you have a blessed Sabbath. Take care, my friends.